Moving closer, uh, so, so you're in it, you're in the picture. Uh, I'm, uh, Robert Manbury, uh, and uh, teaching here in the, uh, some of you, most of you know this, and uh, former, which you'll see here in a second, uh, director of the graduate program. The, uh, not long after out, being out of school uh, in New York City, Lester Walker and I, uh, we were together with Craig Hodgins in the beginnings of works, uh, were teaching at City College in the second year of an undergraduate program. <clears throat> and we got onto this idea of doing something called Whiz Bang Quick City. Uh, this was building structures in the studio and then in the spring going to uh, what we thought was well what we had chosen upstate New York and setting them up and sort of living in these things for uh, three or four days uh, the next year we it became a thousand person extravaganza with, uh, with uh, all sorts of other schools of architecture but this first time out it was just that uh, then uh, our permit for using a piece of land in upstate New York was revoked before we went up there, luckily. Uh, so we ended up uh, backing into a little spot in Woodstock. That was about a, uh, two years after the Woodstock festival. And uh, <coughs> we, we uh, put the stuff up. The, the thing we hadn't counted on was snow, of which there was a lot on the ground. And so we, we essentially froze for uh, two days, but uh, did it. And uh, then uh, we came back and that work was um, published in uh, Life Magazine, actually, in Popular Science. Uh, Life devoted a whole page to it. Uh, it was easy in those days. Uh, somebody wrote us a letter and said, what about this? Uh, for disaster housing, I have this idea, a parachute. Uh, you uh, have supplies in a box and you've got a parachute, but the parachute is impregnated with uh, uh, resin. And you, uh, just before you throw it out the airplane, you spray the catalyst on the impregnated resin on the parachute, and the thing goes down and hardens just so that when it lands on the ground, it's a house, a little house with the supplies inside. We thought that was uh, pretty good. Of course, it had never, never amounted to it. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Jennifer Siegel. Uh, Jennifer is one of the few, uh, uh, I have to say, SIRA graduates to return to and lecture at SIRA. Uh, I, I, I could be off, but uh, uh, it's, in a, it's less than a handful, I think. Uh, one of those is a young lad, Michael something, Rotundi or something like that. <laughs> uh, one of the first students. Uh, the, uh, that was part one. Part two. Uh, part of what might... Uh, Jennifer was part of a class of what might have been the finest... This will sound terrible for some of you uh, in the graduate program. Uh, what might have been the finest graduate class at SIR, including the present company. Yeah. I'm not sure that gets me off the book. Uh, it was the class of 1994. Uh, Jennifer starts at SIR, uh, therefore, uh, about 17 years ago. Uh, at that time, LA was the place to be for architecture, in a way, in the world. It's, it's a little hard to imagine, uh, and certainly in the United States. And SIR was the place to be for studying architecture. Um, these are some names that won't make any sense to you, but uh, they will to Jennifer. Bill Hogan, Hadley Souter, Bill, uh, Peter Arnold, Vic Liptak, John Barone, Trey Parson, Robert Adams, Iris Rockney, Julie Brode, Evelyn Tickle, Alexander Kitchen, Catherine Bennard, and others, and of course Jennifer Siegel. An extraordinary group of people. They're all making uh, noise in the world through a lot of hard work. Three, 
Um, the above were all in my second year graduate studio, and all have gone on to good things. Drawing at that time was in the forefront uh, of, of everyone's interest. Uh, interests. Uh, drawing was seen as crucial to design, and in particular, the drawing uh, uh, design being worked on, not the finished drawing for the project, but using drawing as the way to do your design thinking. There was a range of thinking about representation on the table. There's a, that's a good message here. Uh, Jennifer uh, announced to me in that studio that she was going to do the entire two GA project, second year graduate project, with one drawing, a section. There it was. So I said, okay. Uh, Jennifer's thesis was an interrogation of the do-it-yourself, oh, uh, sorry, yeah, <laughs> this will sound funny. Uh, the do-it-yourself laundry. Am I getting that right? Uh, close. Close, okay. Uh, with waiting time being of particular interest. Uh, Four. Jennifer disappears, as they all seem to, upon graduation for some time. But about ten years ago, one started to hear and see Jennifer's name in association with what has been her obsession for some time, prefabricated and mobile houses and architecture. Recently, she's included green architecture in that mix. Uh, and when I say started to be uh, heard, uh, then in the ensuing 10 years, last 10 years, uh, heard very much so through her work that you'll see. Five, prefab. Uh, this is not a particularly accurate history, but worth uh, putting on the table, maybe. Uh, Prefabrication and mobility in architecture is a long, long story. One, all parts of Greek temples were prefabricated at the quarry. This is true. The Crystal Palace, now we've jumped ahead uh, 4,000 years. The Crystal Palace, uh, or 2,000 years. The Crystal Palace Industrial Revolution's tour de force through architecture. But architecture starts with uh, Prefab and portability right at the beginning, as we were all hunters and gatherers for a long time, and nomadic for about two million years. Architecture's first known building dates from about 300,000 BC, a, a little known story. Uh, the US gave us, gave the world probably, the first uh, prefab house in the form of the mobile home with the Airstream being the great example, and maybe the first. Uh, and Bucky Fuller was somehow in that mix uh, on the sidelines. Five, an astounding uh, work uh, of Jean Prouvé in the uh, tropical house, 1948. And finally, in the double wide, this is after World War II in the 50s, probably responsible for, I'm gonna make this up, uh, half a million houses a year annually in the United States, uh, or great number. Uh, uh, one question arises, why do tornadoes and fires somehow seek out these humble structures? Uh, clearly this work, uh, clearly the work needs to fit on trucks and deal with the dimensional aspects of highways and roads. Uh, Craig Hodgett's thesis at Yale, sometime you'll hear about that. MoMA summer exhibit, home delivery, uh, fabricating the modern dwelling this last summer. And finally, in addition, today there's a rash of uh, design build firms putting on the table high design in, form, in the form of prefab, the prefab house. Uh, often, unfortunately, uh, at a million dollars a clip. Six, Jennifer is the founder, principal of o, OMA, oh, excuse me, of OMD, Office of Modular Design, Design and construction of responsible, sustainable, and precisely built structures. Uh, many, many publications of her work. She appears to be the darling of wealth. Uh, but they don't publish your work unless it's of interest, I'll tell you. Uh, always in the books, and there are many on prefab architecture, exhibitions at the Cooper Hewitt National Museum of Design, the Walker in Minneapolis, and the National Building Museum in Washington and one of the emerging voices as recognized by the Architectural League in New York. Note, uh, and this is sort of for 
all of you that are students here at Sire, uh, in the audience, uh, no, uh, none of this uh, came easy for Jennifer. Uh, lots and lots and lots of hard work. I give you Jennifer Siegel, Sire graduate.
and because the trains would couple right behind the studio space, which they did frequently, the entire building would shake, and it was a constant reminder for me of uh, the work that I was doing. My work seeks to rethink and reestablish methods of building that contrast with the generic clutter that increasingly crowds our landscape. Inspired by San Elia's Futurist Manifesto, I share in his philosophy that, quote, we no longer believe in the monumental, the heavy, and the static, and have enriched our sensibilities with a taste for lightness, transience, and practicality. That was from 1906. This image associated in a region of instability, this is a road between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, uh, where the threat of uh, war can occasionally occur, you can easily pull this gas station away. And this desire for the active, mobile, and everywhere dynamic that characterized the Italian futurist machine aesthetic infuses our work at OMD. Shown here is the rock climber whose dynamic form responds to the static rock face, or the parkour's efficient and quick ability to overcome urban obstacles. The smooth versus the striated, as described by Deleuze and Guattari. And while architecture's purpose remains constant, providing shelter from the natural elements and community among its inhabitants, portable and mobile architecture herald, herald the dawn of the age of new nomadism. The applications and uses are limitless. These buildings have no borders. Diversity of material palette, design style, and transportation method are varied. Here, Buckminster Fuller with a Dymaxion dome, and in 1998, Stephen Brower's uh, take on a trailer camp using the Dymaxion car, a three-wheeled vehicle, and uh, a series of domes trying to convince people of a new scheme. So mobile architecture that can be defined not merely in terms of movable structures, but rather as a way of intelligently inhabiting a specific environment at a specific time and place in a way that better reacts to increasingly frequent social and environmental shifts. These fluvial forms are expressed best in the extreme sports world, where surfers meld with the breaking surface and the sea becomes the form giver, or the intuition and innovation of a skateboarder working off the urban infrastructure. This information age whets our appetite for the exploration of the unknown. As inquisitive social beings and innate explorers of the universe, we are standing at a new threshold of curiosity and movement. Biological and technological advancements reveal themselves in our everyday lives, echoing prophecies and environmental visions from American pulp science fiction. Architecture today rolls, flows, inflates, breathes, expands, multiplies, and contracts, finally hoisting itself up, as Archogram predicted at the end of the 1960s, to go in search of its next user. And a couple of images that are inspirational to me that Robert, of course, already named. <laughs> it's way ahead of me. Uh, this is a Wally Byman's Airstream and images of a Japanese love hotel, very small, compact spaces. Um, some recent work from artists that I admire, Lucy Orta and Dre Wagner, uh, thinking a lot about fabrics and the way in which they can be transported and used in very simple ways, and technology. And this was really, you know, the epiphany for me, which was when uh, the computer was introduced onto the scene, uh, which was right when I was finishing school here. And uh, it's become my entire life. This is probably something that's extremely familiar to everybody. The laptop, the iPod, this pretty much makes up my mobile uh, environment and office. You know, ultimately, moving into the direction as Razorfish has, has produced this image, you know, where information will ultimately just be embedded within our bodies. So why are we still building buildings like this? Uh, you know, why are, is the uh, automobile industry, the aerospace industry, uh, way ahead, light years ahead of us in terms of manufacturing and production? And why are we thinking even the way the Europeans are in terms of a fully automated manufacturing facilities? And this is where I think, you know, this is the shift that we're about to um, explore. And I'm also really interested in the ideas of 
you know, not just making, but making in a better way. So uh, publications such as Materials Monthly, something I've worked on with Princeton for uh, a couple of years, where we package materials and you can build a materials library and bring that to your home. But also thinking about two really fundamental basic uh, tenants that we have here in Southern California, wind and sun. Um, these are uh, must-haves, I think, for uh, the everyday architect in LA. This was a project that I did with a group of students at Woodbury University where I taught for about 10 years after school. That was a just very simple shade structure that uh, was created with these PV panels. And it was where we held all of our exhibitions and lectures. Temporary, it's now moved on. Ideas of do-it-yourselfness and movement to trucks. I've always been interested in trucks. And then this question that, actually, I was never asked when I was a student, but it's been a question that comes up in my office every single day. Madam, do you know the weight of your house? This is my house in Venice, and I use it as any you know, good designer does. I experiment on it. And this was a very early morning where I'm craning a, a tractor trailer in over the house and attaching it to the house and uh, working with different craftspeople that I have incredible respect for to open it up and kind of expand it with steel and glass and see how a very simple uh, $1,500 trailer you know, can expand your house by 320 square feet. And this is on, on the heels of that, I, I was starting to teach and I was uh, thinking about ways that I could work with students in, in using hand, our hands and experimenting and it seemed to me that the more we could condense a, a project in a very in a small semester by taking existing structures like trucks and tractor trailers and converting them to mobile classrooms we could really accomplish something and we could actually fly under the radar because we didn't need a lot of building permits so these were some of the very first projects i ever did uh, with incredibly talented students that you know, like all of you, just give it your all. Used uh, all recycled materials, all found objects. And this is a structure that traveled around Hollywood for a period of time where children learned about the life of a tree. And on the heels of that, one summer, working with a good friend of mine, Larry Scarpa, who taught another studio and turned a, an old manufactured home into a construction training center for a group of people in Venice and um, certain really basic ideas of taking old carpet tiles and flipping them upside down so that the rubber faced up for a flooring or just removing two walls so that you could actually open the structure up to the outdoors. Um, I love showing this image in Minnesota, for example, because they're, they always get very upset you know, that this is not something that's possible in their climate and uh, it brings me great joy to, to know that I live in Southern California. Shipping containers and recycling. This is um, along my, my path and along my interests. I was able to um, explore great projects with great clients. And this was for a fellow who owned the brewery, Richard Carlson. And he came to me one day and asked me if I would do a house for him. He knew of my interest and he had the materials. And we very quickly assembled uh, what was essentially a pile of of junk and created a house for him with four shipping containers and two grain trailers. A very simple plan, sort of hard to see, and the section that I've always been interested in of carving this house into the ground and lifting the, or wrapping the materials in the landscape. It's, this house is very private, unfortunately. You can't really see it, but it's not too far away from where we are right now. Uh, it's a, the lot's about 10,000 square feet. And one of, one of his requests was that we park the house in the back of the property so that he, every morning, was forced to walk the property and walk through his garden and get into his car and drive across the street to work. And that was really the only <laughs> rule. <laughs> and that's what he does. So um, a remarkable client, a remarkable house, and it was really made up of all of the materials that you see on the right-hand side. And this garden uh, that evolved over time and, and uh, the 
garden has a real strong relationship to the house because the, the house is very you know, boxy and orthogonal and straight lines and the garden is, is all about nature and, and really exploring what a plant looks like and how that can then interact with this building. So the seamlessness between the indoors and outdoors was something that we were trying to create. I also learned a, you know, why shipping containers are problematic and where they fail and what happens when you cut the cord on a container and you know what happens when you have to come back and you know, restitch the thing together. So um, this was very much uh, a practice I think that I learned here at SciArc, uh, experimenting, trying something in the field, you know, when it doesn't work. Um, I think Robert, you said this, you know, you just rub a little bit of gold powder into it and you sort of make that that uh, mistake into a perfect detail. Uh, and that's what this house was for me. So it was about three months uh, of hard work out in the dirt, and we produced a, a pretty nice thing. It's also made with, I'd say, 80% recycled materials. There are two grain trailers, one's on the inside and one is on the outside, and those are both used as koi fish ponds. They are, the water's recycled through a indoor waterfall. Uh, all of the people that worked on this project were also uh, residents of the brewery, so it made it, it very much of a collaboration. The entire interior design and furniture was done by this fellow, David Mikarski, who's in the picture on the floor, sitting on the floor. And, I really was interested in maintaining the sort of quality of the shipping container and I, I found out that there are steel and aluminum containers and these are uh, four 40 foot long, eight foot wide by eight feet tall containers that are just simply stacked on top of each other and just their weight is what's holding this building together. I have always practiced from research, I've always thought a lot about ideas and I've always looked backwards to move forward. Uh, when I started to develop interests in prefabrication and moving beyond uh, I guess design build projects with trucks, I was looking a lot at people like Corbusier, uh, this is from 1920, uh, and Conrad Waxman and Walter Gropius from 1946, the packaged house, uh, the Lustrin house, this is from 49, uh, it's interesting because all of these, the Eames house, this is also 49, all of these ideas were really percolating in Southern California in, um, at the end of World War II and moving into the 50s. Jean Prouvé's uh, Maison Tropicale, this is also 49, so these ideas are <coughs> happening around the world and then finally Richard Rogers, this is the zip-up house from 1968, which I think is uh, a really important building because of the sort of work that I'm seeing now that comes out of a lot of schools and I think it really set the tone for a lot of uh, the instructors that you have. So I was then asked by a friend of mine who was the editor, or about to become the editor at Dwell, her name was Allison Arieff, one Friday if uh, she wanted to do an article on prefabricated housing and asked me if I had anything uh, to publish, and I didn't, but I told her that by Monday I would have something. And over the weekend, we worked on this project, and uh, it, I had already been processing these ideas for some time and called it the Portable House. Uh, when that first project was published in 2001, my phone started ringing, and I started panicking. And I thought, okay, now I need to figure out how to how do you get involved in manufactured housing without having any experience uh, in business? So I was determined not to fail and took a lot of risks and came up with my first prototype, which we call the Portable House, um, which traveled to two different factories before it found its home and got completed. And this is the same factory that I work with now that's out in Chino that's built all of our projects for the last six or eight years for us. This is a single module. It's steel frame, it's a steel moment frame. It's 12 feet wide by 60 feet long. It's 720 square feet. 
and it resides down the street from our office on Abbott Kinney Boulevard, and we use it as a showroom. And it's a pretty remarkable little space because it's allowed me to bring potential and future clients into a building where you don't normally have that opportunity as a designer because someone's living in it. And it's become a storefront for us. And it shows people the idea of what green prefabricated architecture can feel like. You know, they can kick the tires, they can actually experience the space. And for a small, you know, 12 foot wide space, you get a very open, lofty feeling. And I think I always get that aha moment when people walk in initially and uh, they're surprised, uh, which is good. Uh, and that's when the ball started rolling and we started to um, produce these buildings. And this is a house we've just completed in Santa Monica. It's a very tight lot. It was really a challenge getting these modules in. We maxed out the, the lot. I had some incredible people working with me at this time, uh, Mark Stanker for one. Uh, and this building was built in, in this factory using uh, this system, it's a chassis essentially, it's a steel chassis, and they're attaching the axles and the wheels to it, uh, and then creating the, the, this moment frame, and then the whole building essentially gets wrapped around this steel cage. And they're able to push these volumes around in the factory just on this very simple wheel and chassis base that once it comes to the site, the tongue and the wheels and the chassis get popped off and then the building is either welded to a foundation or um, set in concrete. This is always the most exciting moment when the building pieces show up and you know we're all anticipating uh, road closures and, and some sort of tragedy to occur and uh, it's the people that I think I respect the most in this industry are the crane operators. Uh, they, you know, they hold it together. So this project, the clients uh, moved in and seemed to be pretty happy and it was really um, it was the start of a lot of ideas for me. I really kind of got things rolling. And uh, on the heels of that, I had a, another client who uh, asked for, um, you know, a design that wasn't, that I hadn't really explored before. It was going to be uh, a single level building and uh, I didn't know how far we could actually push these modules. I didn't know how far we could cantilever things and kind of open up space and where could we create garages within or parking within these buildings and, and not have to add pieces? And so this project, which is probably one of my favorites, really became this experimentation of, um, of pushing the boundaries of, of the steel and opening space. So this building is located in Venice and it came in in four pieces and was set up over the course of about three days. Um, one of the modules sunk into a ditch and there's all kinds of you know, exciting stories that happen when you bring large pieces of, of equipment onto a site. Uh, and we attached it to an ex existing structure that was being remodeled as the buildings in the factory were getting built. And uh, that was interesting because it truly aligned itself. The timing was perfect. So within three months, all the, the members came together and, uh, and it fit. I think it's something that you never really, you can't really anticipate the sort of, the feeling in your stomach and the sort of moment of, you know, wow, I can't believe we, this really happened. Yeah. This is a very simple floor plan. They have two children, they're a beautiful family, and they really wanted to have privacy and have a real, again, like a real seamless play between their living space, their their garden space, and um, and the privacy of their back bedrooms, and I feel like you know this building really achieves that for me. I've also been thinking a lot about um, methods to get building pieces to sites when you can't bring a truck down the road, and that's something that we come up against quite a bit here. Uh, this material was something that I've been experimenting with a little bit. SIP panels, structurally insulated panels, they get cut 
and channeled and delivered to the site and essentially snapped together like giant Oreo cookies. And I was asked by Dwell Magazine, invited to join a competition to come up with a prefabricated home. Um, I had was, spent a year as a low fellow at Harvard and during that year I was talking to some people about this concept and uh, came up with a system that I thought was pretty interesting. Essentially, uh, it's an S-shaped system that if you could, and you could truck these elements to the site and they're, they're 12 by 12 by 24 feet long, so they fit on the back of the truck and you can stack them uh, and you can kind of create all kinds of shapes and sizes. And uh, I was very excited about this. And I think that most people that have gotten involved in prefabrication, the first thing you do is uh, you know, come up with cool renderings and then you put those on the web and then you you know, wait to see what happens, and then you realize it's that's not so simple. And then you start to um, figure out what the challenges are. And this house, for me, was really figuring out uh, what, you know, how we could take that system and really make it work. Most of my clients, I say, are based in Venice, which is great, so we can ride our bikes to work and to the site. Uh, this was, this is very close down at the street around the corner from our office. And um, the SIP panels probably took about three days to install coming out from Phoenix. The rest of the building, I'd say, was another six to nine months in the making. Uh, but the prefabricated portion of it was, I think, for me, the most exciting. This client is a, a music producer, so he has a very, uh, sensitive ear and he has a recording studio on this property as well so and I'm actually lucky enough right now to be staying there and it's um, it's probably the tightest building I've ever been in in terms of sound and uh, when, this, when the music's on you know you hear it everywhere clearly throughout the entire house so the sips were such a good idea for transportation that when I was asked by Taliesin to come and spend a semester working with students to do a design build project last year, um, we reintroduced that idea into the desert. And um, I think the students that I find at Taliesin are like the students that existed when I was here because they had nothing, they have nothing. You know, they have a lot of determination and they have a lot of. Uh, ability to sweat and uh, you know you can ask them to do anything and they'll do it and this was this project developed truly because the students pushed it and strangely enough I don't know if anyone's been out to visit Taliesin recently but it was built by a bunch of apprentices but it hasn't changed much since Mr. Wright um, died and it became a, an internal struggle for the students you know in their 20s to be talking to the people that are residents there that are many generations uh, older than them and the building slowly got pushed off of the site farther and farther away so that when it came down to making it you could see that it you know it wasn't an easy task uh, but they did it and this is I think last week they just sent these images um, of this little uh, very simple module that uh, I think we all feel pretty proud of because uh, it was, you know, it's just, it's an accomplishment to build anything in general. We've also been dabbling in schools and, and landscape, and this is a project that we finished last year here in Los Angeles. Same factory that builds all of the houses also builds these schools for us. So it's the same system, and, but it's cheaper to build a school for some reason than a house. Uh, this is the country school. It's a new middle school. It's an addition. Um, to an existing schoolyard, and it's uh, it's a shame because these build these these are photographs of the landscape just went in, and now the landscape is, has taken over, and the kids spend I'd say 80% of their time sort of outside and moving between these different pieces. Um, I think the collaborations that you develop over your career, working with great landscape architects, this is Mark Tessier's art uh, office. And um, those people you truly learn from. And this is, you know, this is what really brings me joy. Um, so materials in this building, 
the cabinetry is all made from a material that's a recycled sunflower seed. So you can see that the husk and the floor is uh, <coughs> called expanco. It's a cork and rubber floor, and it comes in different colors. And the kids really get a sense of you know what these green materials feel like. And they go home and they they tell their parents and they say you know I need my I need my room to look like this. And that's always really you know you think you've done something. Uh, we also think about the future. Uh, this was a, a recent idea that I was asked by a magazine, a wallpaper magazine, to kind of think about housing for the future. And uh, because I'm not just content to, to sort of you know, work with what I've got in front of me, I'm often looking at materials, technogels and luminex, and probably things that you guys are familiar with now, uh, thinking about how you know, these self-contained dwelling units might uh, inhabit the ocean one day when all else fails. Uh, uh, we were also involved in a really interesting competition last year for the uh, City of the Future that was put on by the History Channel. And we were asked to think about what Los Angeles would look like in 2106. Uh, and I feel like, you know, my work is always, it's always done in collaboration. And I, um, I, I can't remember who said this, but, you know, you always look for people that, you know, are smarter than you. And you pull them into your life and you trust them. And uh, you learn from them. And I think that's really been, for me, one of, it's been most successful for me and most gratifying is the collaborations that I find with the people that I work with. So this is just a real quick idea where we're thinking about, you know, when when water becomes the new oil and when Los Angeles starts to uh, learn truly from plant material and uh, how buildings might begin to uh, think like plants and learn from plants and uh, become uh, open up to, to open up to the sun during the day to absorb their energy and shut down at night and uh, how this this kind of city might evolve over time and uh, um, you know how buildings might learn really from uh, its inhabitants. And I think for me that's really the most interesting part of this project is, you know, it's not, the future is bright, you know, the future is optimistic, and the future is, is going to continue to allow us to explore and, and grow. Uh, the future of mobile architecture is unfolding rapidly. As our buildings become more portable and adaptable, they become more useful. Before long, we will shed the bulk and excess of static environments as we look to Generation Mobile and its long-term solutions for the uprooting of today's built st structures. It is this recognition of the fluidity of circumstances, <clears throat> the mobility of demographics and information, and an increasing capacity for architecture to respond to fluidity, whether through low-tech ad hoc vernaculars are through high-tech kinetics and embedded computation. From solo cycling to eco-community housing, I see opportunities for sustainable design ventures that can be employed here and now. Office of Mobile Design is in sync with the grow growing grassroots do-it-yourself movement among designers across the country impatient for change, looking for ways to inject the personal into the social. Thank you. 
what, you know, how does cost uh, play out in, in building a house? And I think I'll answer it like this. The first automobile that you produce, if you charged, you know, the amount of money that it costs to come up with a single prototype, no one would buy a car. You know, it gets spread out over time. And for me, um, while prefabrication is incredible time-saving uh, exercise, it uh, gives you incredibly precisely crafted buildings, uh, and you know you can have any sort of you know modern design that you choose in materials. Um, you're still kind of pushing up against a cost that's probably similar to what a single-family residence you know, designed home might be in LA, uh, unless you're I don't know, some star architect that you know we're charging twelve hundred dollars a square foot. So our buildings have been probably in the range of about two eighty a square foot most recently. Uh, but the time frame is so much faster. Uh, if we were to go into multiple productions, you know that's when your numbers start to come down. And that's obviously been the success of the manufactured housing industry, you know, trailers. You can produce things incredibly quickly and you can get them uh, pre-approved and stamped by the state architect, and then you're just pumping things out. Part of me is interested in that idea of mass production, uh, but I'm also interested in kind of mass customization, and how can I take ideas of, uh, of making pieces, but not just producing the same thing over and over again. So, you know, cost is, it's all relative. <laughs> Bill, yes? Am I correct in remembering that your thesis project here was the first exploration of this whole process? <laughs> you know what? That is a great myth. But <laughs> um, actually, there's a woman named Emily Jagoda. You remember Emily? Remember and her. she was doing a project on trailers. Um, but there was, so no, that wasn't my project. But there was a, a, guy, a fellow who was teaching in <clears throat> at Sire Care the Ten named David Greger, who in my first year here was talking a lot about trailers and trucks and I worked for Craig Hodgins and Mick Fung after I graduated and um, wow. I was very much influenced by those kinds of things and those, you know, people talking about those ideas. Um, I, I lived and worked in a place called Argo Santi before I came to Cyark, and so I was already, you know, a little hippied out. I was already starting to think about, you know, alternatives to to building practices. <clears throat> yes. The question is on the building department, and you know, one of the remarkable things that I found out, and I'll tell you, I knew nothing about this when I got involved in prefab, and now I know a lot. I know too much. Uh, it's interesting because the buildings, when they're DSA approved, they get permitted from the state architect, the Department of the State Architect in Sacramento. So we send our drawings there, they get reviewed, stamped, and um, you're then you could produce that building, you know, any number of times as long as you know you just get a new stamp. The local building department, City of LA, Santa Monica, Manhattan Beach, has no jurisdiction over the DSA. The DSA trumps them. So we then get our foundation permits, our electrical permits, or because from the local building department, the buildings come in and the inspectors aren't supposed to even touch the building. You know, that doesn't always work out like that, it depends on the inspector, but that's, you know, that's the idea. So, in essence, that pushes the project along much quicker, you know, so, and, you know, we still have to conform to the same building codes, to the same material regulations that, you know, anybody in this room does, um, but it's just a different process. Yes? No, the, uh your modular approach to building houses and things like that. Have you considered or has anyone asked you about taking that concept or that building method into kind of like a low-rise or mid-rise type construction? Seeing as how land is more and more difficult and our, plot and our sites are smaller and smaller and smaller, not just narrow, but Sometimes where you only have a 
20 by 20 lot. Mm -hmm. Like we're trying to maximize what we can get out of it. Is this, is this like a format that might work? Mm -hmm. you know, in that? Yeah, so the, the question is, you know, can you use prefabricated modular structures to um, densify? And uh, absolutely. You know, these, the build, they're, you, you saw this is like a steel frame building, right? It's almost like a tank. So you can stack this as many times as, as you want. I think, you know, this particular company says they can go five or six high. But the question is, you know, do you, does that make sense material-wise, right? Because you're essentially adding, you know, a floor on top of a floor on top of a roof, so you're sort of duplicating your material load. Um, but yes, absolutely, you can do that. And, and you know, you see it in other parts of the world. Uh, Los Angeles, for whatever reason, just, you know, we haven't gotten to the point of densification, but uh, I think that we will. I think we're, you know, moving in that direction quite a bit. And the